example of God's compassion for us, Christ's love for us in action. And he heals a woman who has been dead for 18 years, and we describe as being bound by the evil one. In other words, that has been unfortunately suffering because of the will of our enemy, our spiritual enemy, who is able to hurt us physically as well. We must not forget this. But he heals this woman. And one of the most important things that we can take, that we can learn from this healing, is that you have a reminder of the incarnation of God. The true incarnation of God, that God was born in the flesh. Some great miracle that we will soon be celebrating in the Feast of the Nativity. If I, for instance, even though I may have some of God's grace, God will be praised, if I were to touch someone and wish that they were healed of every infirmity that they have, it may have absolutely no effect. But God, who has taken on flesh for our sake, for our salvation, to show us how to live in this world as human beings by becoming as far as he is, well, as far as God is able to be a human being, took on our flesh. And when he touches this woman, she is healed of all of the evil that had been afflicting her for so many years. Because this is God's flesh. This is the, this is the body that belongs to God. And we should remember as Christians, but what this signifies is that our salvation is in the flesh as human beings. We cannot be disembodied spirits. We cannot pretend, we cannot begin to think as Christians that salvation is merely an intellectual or a spiritual exercise that has nothing to do with what we do physically. Our relations with other people sometimes or very often have physical aspect, how we feed ourselves, how we feed our families. How... This of course is the most important perhaps you would say, physical aspect of our existence. And if we neglect the body, then what we are saying is we do not care about Christian salvation. We do not accept that part of a responsibility of being a Christian is to see not only that I am healthy physically, but that our, my brothers and sisters in Christ also are physically healthy. This is, this is a very clear, very clear thing that we can take from this gospel. Now the Lord's compassion, the Lord's love for us is not bound by time or by space or by any particular moment. And when one of the priests, one of the Pharisees, complains that the Sabbath day, the day for, that is set aside for worship, is not the day to come and do work, the Lord becomes angry and angry because what this man is saying is that God's grace, that God's love, should be limited somehow to the understanding or to the conventions that human beings set up which is not the case. We are not the Lord, and we cannot say where God's grace will work. We cannot say how God's grace will work. We must simply look for it to seek God's grace, to seek God's love, and as Christians to share it with others as far as we are able. There is no formula by which we earn God's grace. There is no particular thing that I can do that will make me saved more easily and will make God love me more. But one thing that I can do, unfortunately, one thing that I can do is to limit how God's grace, to limit how God's love works in my life and in other people's life. First of all, through pride, 
that I presume I understand how God works. I presume that I understand how Christ would behave or how God would wish something to happen in any given situation. Lack of repentance is the chiefest sin that most of us suffer from. That we are not repenting for our sins. We are not seeking continually to understand more, to understand better, to enter more into the life of God by emptying myself of my will, not to do what I want, but to do rather what God wishes, to fulfill the gospel. This is what as a Christian I should be doing, to behave as Christ does in this particular instance and to show compassion for other people, to show love for others, and not to think of what particular time it might be or whether it's appropriate or whether someone else would be embarrassed by it. To give a particular illustration, it was not long ago that, unfortunately, I had to ask someone to go, to turn from the chalice, to not partake of the Holy Eucharist. And the reason why I asked this person to sit down rather than to partake of the Eucharist because he told me when I asked that he had not made confession for several months since Pascha last, to be perfectly uh, accurate. And the reason that you would say, well, how is it that I say that we should always show God's grace and always be ready to show God's love and to share God's love and yet, at the same time, I will turn someone away from the chalice when they come. Precisely because of what I have just said about repentance. It is a responsibility of the Christians to remember to repent, to remember that before God that I am nothing, that I do not exist without God, and I, re I should rely and remember to rely on God for all good grace, and for everything that I need, which he has promised that I shall have if I am seeking it. But repentance is such a basic thing in the Christian life, that if someone goes for several months without making, a, without making confession, without thinking of it, it means that there is something that is not happening in this person's life that should be happening. And if it is not the responsibility of a priest to remind someone who approaches the chalice that repentance is part of the preparation, that I can fast and I can say prayer, but if in my heart I am not repenting, I am not turning to God to cleanse what stupidity I may have in my heart or in my mind, whether I know what it is or not, then I am not even beginning to be prepared to partake of the Eucharist. This is what I mean when I say that I am responsible for limiting how God is able to help. If I am not turning to God, if I am not asking God for help, if I am not relying upon God to provide good things that I should believe that He will. And it doesn't matter to a certain degree how much God loves me. It doesn't matter how much God wishes to give to me His grace. If I am hard in heart and say I don't need it, I'm okay where I am, I'm alright, I'm healthy, I have everything that I need, this is precisely the wrong thing to do. This is the opposite of what a Christian should be doing. And we see in the society in which we live, self-sufficient or supposedly self-sufficient people who do not rely upon anything outside of what they are able to do or what they are able to understand themselves. I run into people like this regularly. But I know, I know everything that I need to do to make myself a good life. And they continue to generally be miserable and to always be looking for more money or more sex or whatever it might be that they're looking for. 
I continue to be unhappy and unfulfilled in their life and insist at the same time that they know what they're doing. So let us ask Christ to be humble. Let us ask Christ to be aware that our grace is from Him, our life is from Him. And that if we are to receive healing, as this poor woman received healing in the Gospel today, that we must be open to it, we must be prepared to receive it. And we, it will not come simply because I want it, but because I have turned to God and I have allowed God's grace to work in me. And to Him be glory now and forever and to ages of ages. Amen. Yeah.